Hello, this lecture is going to be covering Chapter 4, uh, Communications and Documentation. We're going to talk about communicating uh, with patients. We're going to be talking about communicating with other healthcare providers. Um, we'll talk about different communications uh, equipment that we use, including radios, uh, cell phones. We're going to talk about documentation, uh, documenting on, an, on a patient care report, an electronic patient care report, and the importance of documentation. Communication is the transfer, uh, excuse me, transmission of information uh, to another person. Communication can be either verbal or nonverbal. Nonverbal communication we use through uh, body language. Verbal communication skills are important for EMTs. It is one of the most vital uh, elements of being an EMT is knowing how to communicate with others. Um, it's something that um, you know I hope to uh, work on with the class. Um, throughout this entire course is getting you comfortable talking to someone else. Uh, if, you, if you have difficulty speaking with someone, uh, make that a goal of yours to, uh, to start working on that because it's vital um, to be able to, to, to talk with another person, ask them questions, and feel comfortable doing so, which enables you to gather critical information, um, coordinate with other responders, and interact with other healthcare professionals which is all vital in, uh, in healthcare. Documentation's um, obviously really important. Um, I know we've talked a little bit about that with, uh, with the legal elements. Um, documentation, uh, documenting the, the patient's permanent rec medical record is important. It demonstrates that appropriate care was delivered um, and it helps others in patient's future, future care. So that documentation, that report that you're uh, completing on this patient um, is not only for your use, um, but that's also used um, in the hospital. Um, the physicians in the hospital will refer back to uh, the care that you provided and the uh, you know certain medical complaints maybe that that patient had in your care. So it's important to document properly, and we'll talk about that. Um, complete medical uh, pa uh, excuse me, complete patient records, guarantee proper transfer of responsibility. Uh, comply with the requirements of health departments and law enforcement agencies, and they fulfill your organization's administrative needs, including um, patient billing. We'll also talk about radio and tele uh, telephone communications. Uh, they link EMTs to uh, other EMS providers, to the fire department, to law enforcement, to your dispatch center, um, and it's important to know what your system can do and what it cannot do and how to use that radio or telephone communication system efficiently and effectively. All right, so we're gonna start off by uh, talking about uh, age, culture, personal experience, and how that relates to communications. Um, that shapes how a person communicates. Um, body language and eye contact are, are greatly affected by culture. In some cultures, direct eye contact is impolite. In other con uh, cultures, it's impolite to look away while speaking from someone. So. Understanding that there is a wide array of different cultures out there, um, and you as an EMS responder, um, you know, up until this point, you may have stayed, uh, you know, a little sheltered, for lack of a better term, um, around people uh, with similar cultures to you. Um, now you're going to be responding into to people's homes from a variety of different cultures. Um, so just being aware of the fact that different cultures have different uh, different norms is important. Your tone, the pace, the volume of your language, that all reflects the mood of, of you and it, and it uh, reflects um, how that person may perceive the importance of that message. So think about that as you're talking with someone. Think about your tone, the pace, the volume of your language. A couple definitions here. Ethnocentrism uh, is uh, considering your own cultural values more important than those of others. Again, you're going to be out responding on folks. Um, typically, this is the worst day of their lives. Um, you know, it's time to put aside uh, your cultural values and respect them in that moment. Um, so respect everyone's cultural values uh, as if they were your own. And cultural imposition. Cultural imposition is forcing your own values onto others. And that's certainly not something that we're out there to do. We're out there to help folks. Um, we're not there to force our values onto them. Nonverbal communication, again, you know, just as important as verbal communication, body language provides more information than words alone. Um, even without 
uh, exchanging any words, you should be able to tell the mood of your patient. Facial expressions, uh, body language, and eye contact are all powerful communication tools. Um, it helps people understand messages uh, that are being sent. So think about that as you communicate with, with your patients. When treating a potentially hostile patient, be aware of your own body language. Try to stay calm and diffuse the situation by using a calm demeanor and a calm body language. Assess the safety of the scene. Don't assume an aggressive posture, you know, clenched, clenched fists, um, you know, a, a charging type posture. That's not going to diffuse the situation. That's going to make the situation worse. Um, make good eye contact with that person to let them know that you're paying attention to them, but, but don't necessarily stare at them. Speak calmly, confidently, and slowly, um, and never threaten the patient either verbally or physically. Physical factors relating to nonverbal communication, uh, literal noise, sounds in the environment, um, lighting, distance, or physical obstacles may affect your communication. So uh, a lot of times we go into to, uh, patients' houses and, and they, they may not have very many lights, so the lighting is very dim. Or maybe somebody's got the TV on and it's very loud. Um, so doing little things like finding a light to turn on, uh, turning a television down, turning the, turning the radio off, um, simply walking away, uh, you know, uh, walking away further from the from the ambulance. So maybe the motor is running and it's very loud. Um, those are all important steps to improve communication. Cultural norms often dictate the amount of space or proximity between people when uh, communicating. So just again, as far as the cultural side of things, just be aware of the fact that there are other cultures that you're going to be interacting with. Gestures, body movements, and attitude toward the patient are also critically important. Asking questions is a fundamental aspect of pre-hospital care. Um, you have to ask questions, and we're going to practice that multiple times throughout this course um, during your assessments. So the assessments are essentially um, a, a 10 to 15 minute period where you're going to simply ask a bunch of questions, and that's how you figure out what's wrong with, with someone. So you, you obtain a lot of information by asking questions, and it's important to ask questions the right way. Open-ended questions require some level of detail. So uh, using open-ended questions can be helpful. Asking something like what seems to be bothering you allows that patient, allows that person to explain themselves and explain what's bothering them. It's an open-ended question. It allows them to explain things to you. And when they're, excuse me, after you answer that question, allow that person to, to uh, when you, excuse me, when you ask the question, allow that person to answer it. Uh, be silent for a minute, listen to them, listen to what they have to say. It's important uh, to listen as much as it is to, to ask. Clo on the other uh, end of the spectrum, closed-in questions uh, can be uh, answered in very short responses. Sometimes the responses are single, single word responses. So, uh, for example, asking, are you having trouble breathing? You know, that person can simply say yes. Well, that doesn't tell you a lot of information about what's going on. Uh, it's a single word answer. So sometimes that's not appropriate. However, there are some times where that is appropriate. If you can visibly, you know, visibly tell that the patient is struggling to breathe and they don't want to talk to you, that may be an important time to use a single word response type question. Asking, are you having trouble breathing? Allow them to answer that simply with a yes or a no, uh, rather than having to explain themselves. First, interviewing techniques. When interviewing a patient, consider using touch to show caring and compassion. Um, use that consciously and sparingly. Um, avoid touching torsos, face, uh, chest, you know, touching a patient's hand, touching them on the shoulder. You know, those, that's, that's appropriate. Um, but, but certainly, um, you know, use that in the context of, of that patient. That patient may not want you to touch them at all, and that's okay. You have to respect that. Interviewing techniques to avoid things you don't want to do, um, providing false assurance or reassurance, uh, you know, telling someone, oh, everything's going to be okay, even though um, maybe it's not going to be okay. Giving unsolicited advice, asking leading or biased questions, talking too much. You have to listen, right? You have to listen. You have to listen more than you talk. Interrupting the patient, um, using why questions. So if, if someone were to say, oh, I've got abdominal pain, and you respond with um, why? Why? Why does your belly hurt? Um, you know that's that's if they knew that answer, they wouldn't have called us. So asking those kind of questions, it's kind of an insult 
um, to the patient. Um, so be careful when, when asking questions like that. You're there to figure out why their belly's hurting. That's why they called you. Um, avoid using authoritative language. Um, you know, we're not, you know, technically we are, you know, a government entity, you know, potentially, uh, we're not, we're not an authoritative figure. We're not, uh, in a position of authority, um, where we need to use authoritative language generally. I mean, there's certainly a time or a place for that. Um, but on your average run, you know, using authoritative, authoritative language should be avoided. Uh, speaking, avoid speaking in professional jargon. Um, the patient doesn't know, um, you know, they've not been through EMT school. They don't know what you're talking about if you're using any sort of professional jargon. So try to keep it in plain, simple English. Presence of family, uh, friends, and bystanders. F friends and family may be valuable during the patient interview process. I've also had a lot of family and friends be very invaluable <laughs> during the patient interview process. Um, so you got to kind of play that by ear. If they're going to be helpful, that's great. Use them. If they're not going to be helpful, um, give them a task, give them a job, give them something to do and get them away so that your communication with the patient can improve. Allow the patient to answer even if well-meaning uh, family members attempt to answer, answer for the individual. This happens all the time uh, with us. We'll ask the patient, um, uh, what day is it today? And we're asking that patient to determine their level of responsiveness, their level of consciousness. Can they answer a simple question like, what day is it today? And inevitably, uh, a family member chimes in after about uh, half a second and, and tells them the answer. Well, you know, that doesn't help us. So um, don't be afraid to ask um, those family members to step aside for a moment if you need to ask the patient a, a specific question. Some golden rules to think about. Uh, make and keep eye contact at all times, certainly if it's culturally appropriate. Um, provide your name and use the patient's proper name. It's important to introduce yourself as you arrive on the scene. Hi, my name is Luke. I'm a paramedic. Uh, or my name is Luke. I'm an EMT. Um, what seems to be the problem today? Okay, Mr. Smith, um, I understand that you're having abdominal pain. You know, speak to them respectfully. Um, provide your name. Tell them the truth. Use language the patient can understand. Um, be careful what you say uh, about the patient to others, and be aware of be aware of your body language. Some more golden rules. Speak slowly, clearly, and distinctly. If the patient is hard of hearing, face the patient so he or she can read your lips. Um, don't just speak louder. If they're hard of hearing, speaking louder to them is an insult to them. Um, face them and allow them to read your lips. Allow the patient time to answer or respond to any question that you may ask. Act and speak in a calm and confident manner. Communication with older patients. This can be difficult sometimes. So here's some things to think about when communicating with an older patient. Identify yourself. That's a respect thing. The, the older community, that's how they were raised, to introduce themselves. Shake, you know, a, a firm handshake and introduce yourself. Present yourself as competent, confident, and caring. That's going to gain their respect. Uh, do not assume that an older patient is senile or confused. They may be very with it. You may encounter hostility, irritability, and some confusion. Don't assume that this is normal behavior. Try to figure out if that's normal for that patient. Otherwise, it may be some medical condition. Approach an older patient slowly. Approach them calmly. Um, don't be too aggressive. Don't come at them uh, very quickly. Allow the patient plenty of time to uh, answer and respond to your question. Sometimes it just takes a little bit longer um, for that uh, elderly person to process the question and, and come up with their, their response or their answer. Uh, watch, certainly watch for signs of confusion, anxiety, um, or impaired hearing or vision. That's not normal for the patient. The patient should feel confident that you're in charge and that everything possible is being done for them. Um, and certainly be patient. Just be patient with, with our older um, our older patients. Oftentimes they don't feel uh, much pain. So if they are complaining of pain, you know, we're going to take that seriously. Um, they may not be fully aware of important changes in their body system. Um, you must be especially vigilant for uh, any sort of objective changes. When possible, give patients time to pack a few personal items. And this doesn't necessarily just go with older patients. This goes with any patients. A lot of times we tend, you know, and myself included, sometimes we get frustrated with patients. They call 911 because they're having an, an emergency um, and then when we get there and we say, all right, let's, we'll take you to the hospital, let's go. Um, well, then it's time to, you know, pack up 16 suitcases worth of stuff because they've got to take it all with them because they have, you know, they absolutely have to have all of these things. 
you know, sometimes that does get a little bit frustrating. I understand that. Um, but it, it, you know, it, it is okay to allow them to pack a few personal items. If that's going to make them feel better and feel more safe and more secure, allow them to pack some items um, uh, before, they, before they head out with you. Locate, certainly for the older community, locate hearing aids, glasses, and dentures before your, your departure. That's, those are important items um, to these folks. Older patients are often worried about the safety of their home, valuable items, and pets. So, um, you know, sometimes we have to think outside the box a little bit. Sometimes a patient doesn't want to go to the hospital with us simply because, um, you know, they, they know their pet's not going to be fed. Uh, so doing something like helping them get some food set out for their pet or helping them call a, a neighbor or going over and asking a neighbor if they can come watch the animals or something like that. So, uh, you know, try to make them comfortable um, with what's going on. Um, communicating with children, uh, so uh, communicating with children, uh, uh, you know, just as if not more difficult than, than communicating with the older population. <clears throat> Emergency situations can be very frightening, and, and uh, fear is, is very obvious, and it's severe in children. Children may be frightened simply by your uniform, by the ambulance, by a crowd of people, loud noises. Um, don't hesitate to let a child keep their favorite toy, their doll, a security blanket, it's okay, they can hold on to that kind of stuff. Um, if possible, have a family member or a friend nearby. If it's practical, let that parent or guardian hold the child during evaluation and treatment. It is, it is completely acceptable to allow um, that, that family member to, to hold on to that child while you're doing, in, while you're doing your assessment. Be honest with children. Children um, can easily detect a liar. They can easily see through lies and deception. So be honest with them. If you're going to put a blood pressure cuff on a child, tell them that it's going to squeeze their arm and it may hurt for a second. Because if you tell them that and then it happens, they're going to trust you afterwards. They're going to trust what you say because you were honest with them versus lying to them and saying, I'm going to put this blood pressure cuff on your arm. It's not going to hurt at all. And then it does end up hurting them. And now they've, they've pegged you for a liar uh, and they're not going to trust you. You've completely lost their trust. It's going to be even more difficult for you at this point. Speak in a professional, friendly way. Um, don't just assume because they're a younger patient that, that they don't know what you're talking about. You know, these, these kids grow up quick and, and they can understand what you're talking about. Maintain eye contact and position your, yourself at the child's level. Don't look down on a child. Um, kneel down, squat down so that you're closer to their eye level. Communicating with hearing impaired patients. Again, uh, another, another um, uh, difficult um, subject to talk about here. Um, most have uh, most uh, patient, hearing impaired pa uh, patients have normal intelligence and, and are not embarrassed by their disability. Position yourself so they can see your lips. Again, they're very good at reading lips, so allow yourself uh, to be in a position so that they can they can read lips. Uh, hearing aids they may have been uh, forgotten. If the patient's confused, ask a family member about their use of a hearing aid. Where is their hearing aids? Can we make sure that we have their hearing aids and take them with us? Steps to take to efficiently communicate with patients who are hard of hearing. Have a paper and pen available. Um, have a paper and pen so you can communicate that way. That might be a lot easier than, than any other way. The patient can read lips, face the patient, speak slowly, speak distinctly um, so that they can read your lips. Never shout. Again, shouting on a, a hearing impaired, uh, at a hearing impaired patient can be very disrespectful. Listen carefully, ask short questions, and give short answers. This is a time where you may have to, to ask, you know, short one word response questions or answers. Um, learn some simple sign language. Uh, if you look at the pictures here, the pictures from left to right um, are showing you so the sign language for sick, hurt, and help. It's helpful to know a couple, a couple things um, so that if in the event that you do have a hearing impaired uh, patient, you can communicate um, at least a, a few simple a few simple. Communicating with the visually impaired patients, um, uh, first thing is to ask the patient if he or she can, uh, can see at all. A lot of times visually impaired patients are not necessarily completely blind. Um, expect the patient uh, to have normal intelligence. Uh, explain everything that you're doing as you're doing it. Stay in physical contact with that patient as you begin your care. Um, if you have physical contact with them, then they know where you're at, and that makes them more comfortable. Patient can walk to the ambulance, place his or her hand on your arm, and you always lead them 
um, and you allow them to uh, to essentially follow you while holding on um, to you. That's for uh, our visually impaired patients. Transport mobility aids such as a cane or uh, um, you know any other uh, mobility aid should be transported with the patient to the hospital, and that includes guide dogs. Um, guide dogs, if possible, we need to transport those with the patient. That alleviates a lot of stress for both the patient and the dog. Non-English speaking patients, um, it's important to find a way to obtain a medical history somehow. Um, find out if the patient speaks any English at all. Uh, you can use short and simple questions using um, very generic terms. Um, point to parts of the body. Certainly could have a family member or a friend interpret. Um, I know a lot of the non-English speaking areas around Columbus that we respond to, um, usually we find the youngest person in the room and they're usually the ones that know English. So usually um, if they're non-English speaking, they've got a, a child or a grandchild who is or was born in the United States and uh, knows English very well, can speak it very well. So we usually find uh, the youngest person in the room and have them um, interpret for us. Uh, you can certainly consider learning some common phrases in another ang uh, language that's used in your, in your area. There are, sp there are pocket cards out there that, that show the pronunciation of some terms. Um, and you can certainly use a smartphone um, app or a website to help you translate. I've used Google uh, quite frequently to translate for me. Uh, I just talk into my phone, I tell um, Google what I want it to translate, and then I show my phone to the patient. It works very well. Uh, remember to request a translator at the hospital. Uh, excuse me, hospitals have translators um, available. Um, you just have to request it uh, from the hospital. All right, so switching gears here, talking about communicating with other healthcare professionals. Um, communicating with patients is important, um, and communicating with other healthcare professional, professionals is just as important. Um, your reporting responsibilities do not end when you arrive at the hospital. You must communicate with other healthcare professionals at the hospital. Um, by giving an oral report to hospital staff um, who, is a, who has at least your level of training. So you're going to communicate generally with a nurse. You're going to give an oral, oral report um, to the hospital upon arrival. Um, some components of, the, of that oral report are going to give some uh, initial opening information. Name, chief complaint, or, or the illness. So you know, this is Mr. Smith. He's complaining of abdominal pain today. Going to give some detailed information that you did not provide during your radio report, and we'll talk about the radio report here in a little bit. And then you're going to provide any important history that you have not already mentioned um, to the nurse uh, about your patient. You're going to report the patient's response to uh, any treatment that was given in route, and you're going to report um, vital signs and any other possible information. So let's talk about written communications and documentation. Um, first off, we'll talk about the patient care report or the PCR. Um, this is also known as a pre-hospital care report. It is a legal document, records all care, uh, excuse me, records all care from dispatch to hospital arrival. There are two types of PCRs, written and electronic. Uh, written PCRs are, um, are kind of going by the wayside. Um, that's what you're going to use here in class today, uh, only because, or uh, not today, but you're going to be using written reports here in class um, uh, simply because that's, that's how we can keep track of things for you and keep those in your files um, to show that you've been trained on them. Um, but in the field, majority of the time, mo most uh, departments and, and uh, EMS and fire departments are using electronic uh, patient care reports, otherwise known as ePCRs. The, the patient care report serves six different functions, continuity of care, so it allows the hospital to know what we did, what, we, how, what care we performed to that patient, and it allows that patient to continue on into the hospital. It's also legal documentation, so it certainly can be used in the court of law. Uh, it serves as education, so later on you're, you're uh, wanting to learn more about a particular case, you can use that document as a, a sense of education. Serve some administrative information, billing, those types of things. It's an essential research uh, uh, record, so um, some of that information can be used in certain research studies. And it's uh, used for evaluation and continuous quality improvement. So uh, your supervisor or your quality improvement officer is going to um, review that ePCR or that PCR 
and ensure that uh, the highest quality of care is, is being given um, at all times. Some different information that's collected on the patient care report, uh, the patient's chief complaint, which is um, the, the, the most uh, concerning thing to that patient at the time. That's what their chief complaint is. Their level of consciousness, their mental status, any sort of vital signs that you've taken, an initial assessment, patient demographics, so their name, address, social security number, birthday, all of that stuff. Some administrative information that's gathered from a patient care report includes the time that the incident was reported, all of your all of your EMS unit times when they were no, when you were notified, you arrived at the scene, left the scene, so on and so forth. So what you see here on the left is a uh, EP. This is an EPCR. So this is an electronic patient care report. So you can see there's some boxes that need that can be filled in. There's some drop down boxes that you can use to select um, different items. Um, that is a computerized uh, version of a patient care report. In class, you're going to be using a written patient care report or a patient assessment form, as we call it. And once you come into class uh, during lab, we will show you that patient care report um, that you're going to be using. During lab. The narrative section of the patient care report, and again, we're going to go over these patient care reports a lot more in depth when we have you in class and you're able to look at uh, a patient care report. Um, but the narrative section of that patient care report includes um, some important elements. It has a timeline of events. It has your assessment findings, any sort of medical care that you provided, um, any changes in the patient after treatment. You're going to write down any observations at the scene, so certain things that you saw. Uh, the final patient disposition, so what happened. You transferred care to the hospital. The patient refused uh, 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 transport, so on and so forth. And then any staff members who uh, continued the care, is going to, that you're going to document that in your uh, patient. Include any significant negative findings um, and important observations about the scene. Um, so negative, uh, significant negative findings or otherwise known as pertinent negatives are, are things that you're going to look for to rule something out. So if a patient is um, outside of the park and they're having difficulty breathing, you want to rule out that that patient was stung by a bee because that could be a cause of their difficulty breathing. So you're going to include that negative finding in your report. The patient reports that they were not stung by any insects. And that is important because now we know that the respiratory uh, uh, problem that they're having was probably not caused by something like a bee sting. Don't make any judgments about the patient condition, patient's condition. Just, just um, you know, report the facts. Avoid any radio codes and use only standard abbreviations. So avoid using any sort of codes use plain uh, uh, English and um, standard abbreviations. And I will provide you with a, a list of standard medical abbreviations. Remember that the report itself is considered a confidential document. So you should not be sharing that report with anyone who doesn't need it. Now, certainly you're gonna be sharing that report with other medical professionals. You're gonna pass that report on to a nurse, a physician, somebody at the hospital. But you don't know, need to go sharing that report with, with uh, people outside of uh, that person's care. All right, reporting errors, if you leave something out or uh, record it incorrectly, do not try to cover it up. Um, that uh, would lead someone to believe that you were trying to falsify a report. Um, that results in poor patient care. Um, may result in a suspension or legal action. So be honest, if you... If you um, if you discover some sort of error, draw a single horizontal line through the error, put your initials next to it, and write the correct information next to that. So never try to erase it or never try to cover um, up the error with whiteout. Just simply a uh, single line through the error, um, initial it, and uh, write what you meant to, to write uh, directly next to it. Documenting refusal of care. I know we talked a little bit about this before. Um, this is a common source of lawsuits. Uh, thorough documentation is incredibly important. It's really important to document refusals of care very, very uh, carefully. Document any assessment findings and emergency medical care given. Have the patient sign the refusal of care form. It's very important to have them sign the refusal 
that says that you attempted to get them to go to the hospital and they are willingly refusing. Have a bystander also sign that. Family member, police officer, or any other bystander to sign as a witness. And then certainly complete that patient care report um, in its entirety. All right, so we'll switch gears a little bit here and talk about communication systems and different equipment that you may encounter. Radio and tele telephone communications link you and your team with other members of the EMS fire and law enforcement communities. They help the entire team to work together effectively. They provide an important layer of safety and protection. It's important to have that radio with you. If you have a radio with you at all times in the event that you get stuck into a, a, a potentially dangerous situation, you have a lifeline. You have a way to communicate, um, to, to uh, talk with, with your dispatch center or with other um, companies that are out uh, you know, potentially in your area to try to get some help. Talk about different types of radios. Um, base station radios, base station contains a transmitter and a receiver. It sits in a fixed place. So base station radios are typically found in the firehouse or the EMS station. You're going to have a base station radio there. The two-way radio consists of a transmitter and a receiver. Mobile radios, mobile and portable radios. Mobile radios are uh, installed in a vehicle, so they are mobile, but they are permanent in that vehicle. You can't pull it out of the vehicle. So a mobile radio is kind of like a base station, however, it's in a vehicle. Um, that's used to communicate with a dispatcher or potentially with medical control. Ambulance all, ambulances often have more than one. Typically, there's one in the front. As we're driving to the scene, we can communicate with dispatch. And there's one typically in the box, in the back. And that one we would use to contact medical control or to call the hospital to give them a, a radio report or a heads up that, um, you know, hey, we're coming, we're coming to your facility with, a, with this uh, patient. Portable radios. Portable radios are handheld devices. Um, these are essential. You know, it talks about being essential at the scene of a mass casualty incident. Certainly important there, but... These are important at all times. It's important to have a portable radio um, on your person at all times. That way, in the event that you get yourself um, into a position where you need help, you have a lifeline, you have the way, a way to, to contact someone to get help on the way. Uh, Repeater-based systems. A repeater is a special base station radio. It receives messages and, sing and signals on one frequency um, and then automatically retransmits them on a second, second frequency. So a base state, uh, excuse me, a repeater, uh, repeater system is basically a booster. It receives a communication and then it boosts that signal off um, uh, to the next, you know, to the next radio, to the next base station, so on and so forth. So there's a visual there showing you uh, a repeater, uh, repeater tower. Um, so the signal's coming, you know, from the dispatch center. It it pings off of that repeater and it gets boosted up. Um, to, to the, you know, to the, uh, the portable or the mobile radio and the ambient. Other communications equipment, um, an interoperable communication system allows all agencies involved to share valuable information. Most areas um, in the country now, you're, you're able to um, talk to any agency with your, um, with your particular radio. So in Columbus, for example, we can talk um, to anyone in central Ohio, including um, police, um, if we have the right channels programmed into our radios. Mobile data terminals are um, located inside the ambulance. Um, generally, this is a computer or a laptop um, that's mounted um, near the driver's seat, uh, usually in between the driver's seat and the, passion the front passenger seat. And this is a place where you'll receive data directly from the dispatch center. So Generally, what happens is if you get dispatched to a run, you're not just simply listening to the radio for, the, for that dispatch. You will get a, a pop-up that pops up on your computer screen, and it gives you routing information and other information that the dispatcher has typed into that, um, into that run card. Um, allow, this allows for expanded communication capabilities, so things like mapping software. The FCC regulates all radio operators. Um, it allocates the specific radio frequencies and it licenses call signs. Um, just understand that there are people listening. This is important for you to know. Um, don't say whatever you want on the radio. The FCC is listening and there's other people that are listening. 
So we try not to use any patient identifiable uh, information on the radio. We try not to, to announce cell phone numbers over the radio. We try not to, you know, give people's names over the radio. We try to limit what we, what we say on the radio uh, because there are people that are listening. All right, so we'll talk about the process as far as communications go, the process of re responding to the scene. Um, the dispatcher is going to receive the 911 call. They're going to determine the relative importance of that 911 call, and they're going to assign appropriate EMS response units. So that de de uh, depends on the seriousness of the call. If it's a very minor uh, medical emergency, they may send one ambulance. If it is um, something like a cardiac arrest, you may have an ambulance, a supervisor, and an engine company all responding um, to that call. The dispatcher selects, uh, dispatches, and then directs the appropriate um, EMS response units. Um, the dispatcher uh, uh, helps coordinate with other public safety services, and they provide emergency medical instructions to the telephone caller. So if someone calls in and they have somebody who's in cardiac arrest, the dispatcher can actually talk them through um, performing CPR on that person. Uh, EMTs report any problems that took place during a run to the dispatcher. So if they're caught in traffic, if the weather is preventing them from getting somewhere, they're going to report all that to the dispatcher. And then EMTs are going to inform the dispatcher upon their arrival at scene. Um, and that's important because that is time stamped so that we know how long it took us to get to the scene. And then the dispatcher can know how long you have been on the scene with the patient in order to continue to check up on you. Communicating with medical control and hospitals. So again, communication is important. Communication between healthcare providers is important. Um, there are times when we need to communicate with medical control or uh, hospitals. The principal reason for radio communications is to facil facilitate communication um, between you and medical control. Medical control may be located at the receiving hospital or another facility um, or sometimes even in another city or state. Um, these <clears throat> uh, medical control essentially is a physician at a hospital and they are the uh, physician who's responsible for answering your radio calls and giving you help, giving you uh, medical advice and medical direction um, in the field. So. Um, in central Ohio, every hospital has a, a, a medical control physician who's on staff um, throughout, you know, 24-7. So if you call into any hospital in central Ohio and you ask to speak to medical control, they are going to um, grab the doctor, whoever is designated as medical control in that facility, and they're going to put them on the radio with you so that they can provide you with um, uh, instruction. Consulting with medical control serves several purposes. Uh, it notifies the hospital of an incoming patient. It provides an opportunity to request advice or orders from medical control, and it advises the hospital of any special situations that you may have. All right, giving a patient report. Um, so um, as you, uh, I, I mentioned it briefly before, uh, giving a radio report, on your way to the hospital, you're going to call into the hospital, um, not necessarily at this point to contact or to, to speak with medical control, but you're simply going to speak with a nurse or um, sometimes even just a paramedic or a, an emergency room technician um, to give them a heads up about uh, your patient that's coming in. And this allows them to get a room ready so that when you arrive at the hospital, um, hopefully the room is ready to go. You can put the patient directly in the room. The nurse is ready to, to, to transfer care. Um, some some uh, established formats that we use. Generally, you uh, give your unit identification um, and your level of services. So you say this is, you know, EMT so-and-so, and I'm on, um, you know, Delaware County Medic 1 today. Um, you're going to give your estimated time of arrival. You say we're, we're five minutes out, and we've got a 45-year-old male patient, and they are complaining of chest pain. After that, you're going to give them just a very brief history of the patient's problem. So you can say, uh, this patient has been having chest pain for the last hour. You can report your physical findings so you can give them vital signs, those types of things. The patient has uh, 10 out of 10 chest pain, and we've provided them with oxygen, aspirin, and nitro. So you're going to give them a summary of the care uh, given. Then you're going to give a brief description of the patient's response to that treatment. So you can say, I've given them aspirin, nitro, and oxygen, 
and the patient's chest pain is now at a 4 out of 10. So their pain is getting better. That is essentially what your radio report to the hospital would sound like. Medical control um, is either offline or online. Offline medical control is uh, indirect medical control, meaning uh, that medical control is uh, written out in a policy or a procedure or a protocol. Online or direct medical control is when you're actually speaking with them. You may need to call medical control for permission to administer certain treatments, um, determine the transportation destination of patients, or stop and or not transport a patient to the hospital. For our purposes in this class, any time that you want to provide a medication to a patient that's not their own, you can assist a patient with their own medication, but if you want to provide a medication to a patient out of our medical kits, we want you to practice contacting medical control. So for the purposes of this class, if a patient is having chest pain, which you guys will learn all about chest pain, the treatments for chest pain include oxygen, aspirin, and nitro. If you wanted to give that patient a prescription medication out of your kit, such as nitroglycerin, we want you to contact medical control first and get permission to give that medication. In most areas, medical control is provided by the physicians working at the re receiving hospital, and that's the case for Central Ohio. Many variations have developed across the country. Um, the link to medical control is vital to maintain a high quality of care. It's important to know that the physicians are our partners. The physicians uh, trust us, they trust what we're doing, and because of that trust that we have, we're able to work better together. There are a number of ways to control access on an ambulance to, to, uh, on an ambulance to hospital channels. Medical control um, in central Ohio, we generally call hospitals on our mobile radios. So we use our radios in the ambulances to call medical control. Some areas though, some areas, uh, you know, in, even in Ohio, uh, particularly I, I came from the Dayton area originally. Um, in Dayton, um, we used cell phones. We just called the hospital on cell phones. Every medic had a cell phone in it. We would use the cell phone to call the hospital. So depending on where you work, maybe uh, you may have a different way of contacting medical control. The physician bases uh, his or her instructions on the information that you provide to them. So keep that in mind that the information that they're going to give you is only as good as the information that you give them. Um, don't use codes. Use uh, plain language unless you're directed to do so by your local protocol. <clears throat> um, repeat any orders back word for word and then receive confirmation. So if a physician tells you, um, go ahead and provide um, one um, 0.4 milligram uh, nitroglycerin tablet, you're going to repeat back. Okay, I understand I need to provide one. Uh, 0.4 milligram uh, nitroglycerin tab, and then the physician will say that is correct. And that is a closed loop communication. You are repeating that order back to them so that they understand that you got the order correct. It's important to not blindly follow an order that doesn't make sense to you. Remember, you have a scope of practice. We talked about that in the last lecture. Your scope of practice is the, the, the list of things that you are allowed to do by state law. If a physician tells you to do something that is outside of your scope of practice, you have to, it's your responsibility to tell that physician that you cannot perform that skill. There was a court case, it was an interesting court case. Um, I'll try to um, uh, give you guys a link for it when I, when I can find a good one, a good link for it. Uh, but there was a court case uh, that, that came out of um, a couple of paramedics that were on an EMS run with a pregnant female, and the female had or was very close to passing away. I believe it was some sort of trauma scenario. They were pretty far away from a hospital, and she was pregnant, very pregnant, um, close to delivering, and the patient had, um, had expired. The patient was deceased at this point. I mean, it was, it was right in front of them, really, when it happened. They call and contact medical control, and medical control talked to them through um, a cesarean section, talked them through a C-section of, of that, uh, the child. The child ended up um, with severe disability um, due to a lack of oxygen. Um, the child lived for a little while, um, but eventually died. Um, and and uh, while the child was alive, it had a, had a severe disability. So 
after all of this happened, um, the father actually ended up suing um, the, uh, the paramedics and suing the hospital and suing the physician. The only, it's interesting, the only people to get in trouble in this whole situation were the paramedics. The paramedics lost their licenses. They could never, they could never act as, as EMTs or paramedics ever again. Um, and they were held civilly liable for that case. The physician um, had nothing, nothing happen to the physician. And the reason there is it's everyone's own personal responsibility to know what your level of care is, what your scope of practice is. So the whole point behind that is don't follow, don't blindly follow an order that doesn't make any sense to you. If it's something that doesn't make sense to you, you need to, to verbalize that and voice that back to the physician. And be very clear with them that that order does not make any sense or that order is out of my scope of practice. And that's your responsibility to know that. All right, let's hit through, uh, I believe we've got eight uh, review questions here. Uh, number one, when health care providers force their cultural values onto their patients because they believe their values are better, they are displaying what? Ethnocentrism, uh, proxemics, nonverbal communication, or cultural imposition? And the answer for number one is D, cultural imposition. That is forcing your own cultural values onto others because you believe your values are better, uh, and that is cultural imposition. Number two, when communicating with an older patient, you should approach the patient slowly and calmly, step back to avoid making the patient uncomfortable, raise your voice to ensure that the patient can hear you, or obtain the majority of your information from family members. The answer for number two is A, approach the patient slowly and calmly. Number three, while caring for a five-year-old boy with respiratory distress, you should. And you can go ahead and pause the video and read through those answers. And the answer for number three, while caring for a five-year-old boy with respiratory distress, uh, you should D, allow a parent or caregiver to hold the child if the situation allows. You certainly want to provide direct eye contact with the child, um, so avoiding it would potentially frighten them. Um, avoiding it, uh, letting the child hold any toys that may cause the child to be very upset and avoid alerting the child prior to a patient procedure that's, that's false. You want to, uh, alert the patient. You want to tell the patient what the, what procedures you're going to perform. Number four, which of the following pieces of patient information is least, uh, is of least pertinence when giving a verbal report to a nurse or a physician at the hospital? The patient's name and age, the patient's family medical history, vital signs that may have changed, medication that the patient is taking. The correct answer here for number four is B, the patient's family medical history. That is of least pertinence. Uh, their family history is not very important to, uh, to a physician during the, the verbal report uh, to, a, to a nurse or a physician. Now, they may ask those questions on down the road a little bit, but in that initial uh, verbal report, that's not very important for them to know. All right, number five, which of the following statements about the patient care report is true? And you can go ahead and pause the video and read through those. And the answer for number five, which of the following statements about the patient care report is true? The answer there is C, it helps ensure efficient continuity of patient care. A is incorrect because it is a legal document. Um, B is incorrect because it is used for patient billing information. And D is incorrect because um, it is intended for use for all care providers, not necessarily just pre-hospital care providers. Number six, when treating a potentially hostile patient, you should try to diffuse the situation by assuming an aggressive posture, staring at the patient, speaking calmly, confidently, and slowly, or verbally threatening the patient. The answer there for number six is C, speaking calmly, confidently, and slowly. Number seven, all the following are functions of the emergency medical dispatcher, except 
alerting the, pay, the appropriate EMS response unit, screening a call and assigning it a priority, providing emergency medical instruction to the caller, and providing medical direction to the EMT in the field. The correct answer there for number seven is uh, D, providing medical direction to the EMT in the field. That is not something that the uh, emergency medical dispatcher does. That is something that medical control does, the medical control physician. And finally, number eight, after receiving an order from medical control over the radio, the EMT should carry out the order immediately, disregard the order if it's not understood, obtain the necessary consent from the patient, or repeat the order to the physician word for word. And the correct answer there for number eight is D, repeat the order to the physician word for word. Again, that is that closed loop communication that allows us to, to correctly carry out the order uh, that the physician is requesting. All right, and that wraps us up for chapter four, communication and documentation. And thanks for listening.